We are now just a few weeks out from the release of Pokemon Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl, so I figured it was a good time for one last run through Sinnoh. The original Diamond and Pearl are a bit weird though, so let's just go for Platinum instead. As you probably realise from the title, I'm going to be attempting to beat the game using only quad weak Pokemon wherever possible. We've done this once before in Pokemon Fire Red, and it's a challenge that I really enjoy. It massively ramps up in difficulty as the game goes on, which is exactly how it should be. The rules are fairly simple. For every major battle, we'll be matching our opponent's number of Pokemon and their levels, but we'll be using only quad weak Pokemon. So, if they're an electric type trainer, then we can only use water flying types because those are the only ones four times weak to electric. If there aren't any available quad weak Pokemon, then we can just use anything that takes super effective damage. Items are completely off limits in battle, including held items, because things like the Focus Sash would really decrease the difficulty here. We'll also be playing on a set battle style for the majority of the game unless the situation calls for shift. One final rule is that I'll have to use every available option before doubling up on any one Pokemon. For example, we can't use a team of four Gyarados against Volkner. There are five different water flying types in Pokemon Platinum, so we have to bring four of them. Alright, with all of that covered, let's get into the challenge. We're going to start off with the first gym battle in Orberg City because the early rival battles are sort of pointless. If we make it as far as the Pokemon League, then we'll do the final battle against Barry, making the five preceding face-offs kind of unnecessary. Anyway, just like Fire Red, Pokemon Platinum starts off with a Rock-type Gym Leader in Rourke, giving us plenty of overpowered options. Rock is super effective against Fire, Flying, Bug, and Ice, meaning any Pokemon that combines two of those typings is a quad-weak option. As a result, we can bring in Moltres, Articuno, and Scyther without breaking any rules. Perhaps Rourke was told what the challenge was because he actually starts by calling for Stealth Rock, which is kind of clever here. It doesn't stop Moltres from knocking off his Geodude, but it'll cause big problems on any switches. Onyx goes for a more attacking option, scoring a critical hit on Rock Throw, but even that isn't enough to knock out Moltres. That sort of speaks to the easy introduction this challenge gives us by putting Rock up first. As the game goes on and gym leaders start using stronger teams, the battles get a lot tougher to survive. Despite the potion usage, Moltres makes light work of Onyx with some critical hits of its own before finally falling to Cranidos. Scyther is sliced up by the Jagged Rocks on entry, but one Rock Smash finishes the battle without Articuno even getting a look in. This gets a lot more difficult, I promise. We have a quick chat with Rourke about how we caught two legendary Pokemon in the first hour of our journey and then exit the gym. We somehow come out right in Eterna City with a brand new team of three. Golem, Quagsire, and Marshtomp make up our trio this time around, so I guess we're facing a Grass-type gym now. Another early gen staple was the second gym leader having one ridiculously powerful Pokemon. Misty had her Starmie, Bugsy had his Scyther, and Gardenia's got Roserade. With a base special attack stat of 125 and Magical Leaf at her disposal, Roserade is incredibly dangerous if you've for some reason decided to use Pokemon that are all quad weak to Grass. Gardenia leads off with her Turtwig, and we start with Golem and immediately call for self-destruct. That is just the only way to assert dominance here. With one Pokemon from each side down, Roserade and Swampert come out next. Thankfully, Professor Rowan gave us the TM for return early on, so Swampert can deal some good damage. Gardenia bizarrely decides to go for Stun Spore instead of Magical Leaf, and it misses to hand us an easy victory. We got very lucky, but I didn't want to go through another battle without using my whole team, so I switched in Quagsire, who got instantly wiped out against Cherim. In the end, a grass not leaves Swampert incredibly weak, but we make it through thanks to Return. With that, we can skip forward to Heart Home City, but we aren't going to spend too much time here. This is the first of two major battles where we can't select any quad weak Pokemon. Hoopa and Lunala would both work now, but as of Gen 4, there aren't any Psychic Ghost Pokemon, so we're just using pure Psychic types. As it's Pokemon Platinum, I just figured I'd use the late Guardians, Azelf, Mesprit, and Uxie. This video is really about the 4 times weakness though, so we can just brush over this battle. Azelf defeats Fantina's Duskull before falling to Miss Magius, then Yuxi comes in and knocks out the ghost with confusion after a lengthy back and forth. Finally, Haunter falls to a single blast of confusion for yet another gym battle victory where we really could have got through with just two Pokemon. Alright, back to the quad weak stuff. In Veilstone City, we've got the fighting type gym which opens up lots of potential options. Fighting is super effective against normal Ice, Rock, Dark, and Steel, meaning any Pokemon that combines two of those is usable. I ended up settling on Tyranitar, Bastiodon, and Weavile, who match up fairly well against Malian's trio. I mean, about as well as a team of quad-weak Pokemon could. 
The battle gets underway with Tyranitar facing off against Meditite with Sandstream whipping up a sandstorm right away. Fake Out is just a minor speed bump on the road to Tyranitar biting Meditite into unconsciousness. Maylene sends out her ace Lucario second and starts by calling for Force Palm. It's not quite enough to knock out Tyranitar so he just pops out for a bite to eat landing a super effective Fire Fang. Another Force Palm ties up the match so we go out to Bastiodon. By outspeeding the lumbering dinosaur and attacking with Drain Punch, Lucario is able to heal up a bit. Unfortunately, Bastiodon follows up that restoration by missing a Fire Blast. Thankfully, Lucario returns the favor, failing to connect with Bone Rush. That allows Bastiodon to send a second Fire Blast back at the Aura Pokemon, which is good for the knockout. So I guess the Veilstone department store deserves a shout out for stocking that TM. When Machoke comes out last, we burn a couple of turns using Protect to let the Sandstorm damage the fighting type. Once it fails, a vicious Karate Chop takes the battle into a one-on-one. -on -one. Weavile enters last and attacks with a Brick Break that's countered by another Karate Chop. With both Pokemon incredibly weak after another blast of sand, Weavile strikes with Brick Break again, knocking off Machoke to hand us the win. Okay, that one took a while. A lot of the difficulty in this challenge is just figuring out which Pokemon match up best and what moves they need to get through the battle. I was originally using Agron in this one, but Bastiodon wound up being a much better fit. Having defeated Maylene, we can exit the building through the portal to the Pastoria City Gym. As you can probably tell from the color scheme and the potential drowning risk, Crasher Wake is a water type gym leader. This may surprise you, but there's actually only four fully evolved Pokemon that are quad weak to water. It feels weird, but it's true. Rhyperior, Golem, Magcargo, and Camerupt are the only Pokemon that fit into that category. I'll actually be ignoring the last two to bring in Onyx, who's the fastest option of all those quad weak to water. We lead off with the Rock Snake as Wake sends out his Gyarados to lower our attack with Intimidate. We spend our one turn using Screech before Brian washes away poor Onyx. Another thing that makes this challenge tougher in Pokemon Platinum is this is back when Sturdy was completely useless. Prior to Gen 5, all it did was block Oko moves, so the plethora of Pokemon who possess the ability really aren't up to much in Platinum. Our max speed Golem comes out second and strikes first with Rock Throw against the defensively compromised Gyarados. The one shot ties up the battle with Wake calling on his Quagsire next. On my first run through this one, I attempted to self destruct against him because I forgot he had Damp. This time around, I know, so we're just attacking with Earthquake. Quagsire counters with a Water Pulse that just falls short of knocking out Golem, meaning another EQ hands us the lead. It's probably not going to last long as Floatzel has a base speed stat of 115, but we were ahead for a second there. Rhyperior is up last and has the ability Solid Rock, which reduces damage from super effective attacks so we can live a hit. The only way we can actually win this is with an Oko move though, so we call for Horn Drill and cross our fingers. This was most definitely not our first try here. I didn't start this one with Onyx, but eventually realized that getting off that early Screech was our easiest path to victory. Crash Awake really only gave us one option there, and that was to finish with a one-hit KO move, which I think we landed on our fourth attempt. Alright, the next gym battle is against Byron in Canalave City, and as he specializes in Steel types, we have no quad weak options once again. Amora, Aurorus, Alolan, Ninetales, Carbink, and Deancey all fit the bill, but we're a few generations early for any of them. So, like Fantina, we're just going to skim through this one. I chose the team of Glaceon, Regirock, and Regice, so I wasn't really expecting too many problems. After several minutes of switching from us and healing from Byron, Regice knocks Magneton out with superpower. Then another superpower from Regirock takes care of Bastiodon before a crit Glaceon Water Pulse defeats Steelix to earn us the Mind Badge. This was actually a surprisingly difficult battle. It took quite a few attempts, and in this one we got pretty lucky with some crucial misses from Byron. Now. Time for a gym puzzle that I really hope they change for the Sinnoh remakes. Honestly, the Snowpoint City gym isn't quite as bad as that mess in Veilstone, but it still takes me about 5 minutes every single time. As the puzzle hints, Candice uses Ice-type Pokemon, which essentially hands us the win before we even get going. Ice is quite effective against Dragon Flying and Dragon Ground, which means we can select some of the most powerful Pokemon in existence. Rayquaza, Dragonite, Salamence, and Altaria was the team we ended up going with here, but there were a ton of other options I could have used. Candice leads off with her Sneasel, who strikes first against Rayquaza, connecting with Ice Shard. It's not quite enough for the KO though, so Dragon Claw gives us an early lead. Frostlass comes out second for the gym leader, but lasts all of 10 seconds against Rayquaza thanks to Crunch. Abomas knows third in line, and she gets a Hailstorm sorry, but that's about all. Fly cuts down the cold tree to leave the Snowpoint Gym Leader with only one. 
Rather impressively, Piloswine lives through Dragon Claw and knocks out Rayquaza with an avalanche. Then, when Dragonite comes in, Candace uses a full restore in an attempt to begin her sweep, I guess? A 1-2 of Fire Punches puts a quick end to that though, knocking out Piloswine to take us up to 7 gym badges. If Candace had used a Weavile with Avalanche, we might have been in trouble, but really, Ice is always going to be a fairly easy challenge in a run like this. With that win, we can leave Snowpoint City behind and head for Sunny Shore where the final Sinnoh Gym Leader awaits. Volkner uses a team of 4 electric type Pokemon, and as there are only 5 Pokemon quad weak to them as of Gen 4, our choice is almost made for us. Gyarados, Wingull, Pelipper, Mantike, and Mantine are the 5 options, and on this occasion it'll be the baby Pokemon who misses out. Wingull's base stat total is fairly pathetic, but a base speed stat of 85 makes it a very interesting option here. The battle gets underway with Jolteon facing off against Wingull, so a pretty fair fight. The Waterbird makes it rain, in a precipitation sense and not the throwing money, I don't think you can even do that with wings. The reason for that rain dance is Mantine's Swift Swim which we will need to make use of later. After wasting a turn paralyzing Wingull, Jolteon blasts him out of the air with Charge Beam taking us down to 3. Mantine comes out second and thanks to Swift Swim boosting his speed is able to strike first with Hidden Power Ground. It doesn't even deal much damage though so Jolteon gets off another Thunder Wave Charge Beam combo. Mantine's incredible special defense prevents a knockout allowing another Hidden Power to connect knocking off Jolteon to tie things up. Raichu enters and attacks with Charge Beam though, so that doesn't last long. We call in Gyarados next, who outspeeds Raichu, causing an earthquake that was never not going to be a knockout. From there, we can actually just sort of coast. Another earthquake one-shots Luxray, and a third best Electivire, so that was surprisingly easy. Pelipper didn't even make it into the battle, which in hindsight makes the thumbnail sort of confusing. Wingle just doesn't fit into it very well. Anyway, if there's one thing we've learned today, it's that Volkner needs to do some speed training with his Pokemon. That's it. With all 8 Sinnoh Gym Leaders defeated, we can head for the Pokemon League and change the battle style to Shift because we've got a match battery Pokemon for Pokemon. Just a quick rundown, we've got Parasect for Staraptor, which is not ideal, Golems are counter to Floatzel, Magnezone will take on Snorlax because Earthquake is the only move it has that deals quite effective damage, then Weavile's here for Heracross, who doesn't have any bug-type moves, Swampert's our Roselia match, and Scizor is here to take on Infernape. This will not be fun. Barry leads off with his Staraptor and calls for Aerial Ice. Our max defense, max HP Parasect can just about live that hit, allowing a guaranteed connection on Spore. From there, we need Staraptor to sleep for three turns or wake up after two and miss a Steel Wing. Don't ask me why, but that happens sometimes. This battle took many hours of chopping and changing, so I know just about everything that can happen here. The vast majority of attempts ended right here. When Barry sends out Infernape, we actually don't switch. Parasect is quad weak to fire too, so it's fair game. The reason we don't switch is our win condition is Effect Spore putting this thing to sleep. Or it can go for Focus Blast and miss. I think this was literally one of two times that happened though. 9 times out of 10, Barry called for Flamethrower, which can't trigger Effect Spore, and we'd reset. After using Spore, we switch Parasect for Scizor, who lands an Aerial Ace and then a quick attack to take down Barry's starter. If Infernape wasn't asleep, it outsped and went for Flamethrower, and even a critical hit on a quick attack wasn't enough for a one-shot. Our only possible way through that was with the help of Parasect. Weavile vs Heracross is a guaranteed win every time, so no need to focus there. In fact, once we made it past the start, things got a lot easier. A Golem Explosion knocks off Floatzel in one before Swampert's Earthquake does the same to Roserade. The final matchup sees Magnezone taking on Snorlax, and once again, Explosion does enough. That was actually the first time I made it past Infernape. I'm really glad the rest of the team I put together made sense, because those first two battles were a nightmare. Okay, every member of the Elite Four uses a typing that can deal quite effective damage, so let's get right onto the first battle. Aaron is a Bug-type trainer, and as a result, we get to use Celebi. We've also got Shiftry, Cactur, Nuzleaf, and Executor. In fact, Execute is the only available Pokemon that we're not using. Celebi starts us off with a quad effective move of its own, knocking out Yanmega with Ancient Power. When Vespaquen comes out, we switch in Nuzleaf, who, thanks to a call for Defend Order, gets off Fake Out and Rock Slide. Attack Order eventually seals his fate, but that was actually pretty impressive. Shiftry is next in line and enters the battle with revenge on his mind. A Rock Slide wipes out Vespaquen, so Aaron sends out his Heracross. We're never going to live through a Megahorn, so we go for Explosion with Shiftry and decimate both Pokemon. 
Cacturn and Scizor enter the battle next, which is sort of ideal for us as that's the exact matchup we wanted. Cacturn's Fire-type Hidden Power blows away Scizor to leave Aaron with only one. Drapion's up last, and weirdly, this is where we ran into problems. The only non-bug on Aaron's team was the hardest hurdle to overcome. Cacturn gets annihilated by an X-Scissor before Executor lives through the same hit. Sadly, he misses with Hypnosis, rendering that survival completely pointless. Aerial Ace takes the battle into a one-on-one -on -one with only Celebi left on our side. The mythical Pokemon's hidden power ground falls just short of the knockout, but X-Scissor can't finish things either. Aaron appears to give us a speech about never giving up pretty much right as Celebi knocks out his last Pokemon and he admits defeat. That wasn't too bad. It took a good number of tries before we figured out a way past Drapion, but excitingly, you got to see the only attempt where Nuzleaf actually got to do something. Bertha's up next, and she's way ahead of the curve in this challenge. Three of the five Pokemon on her team are quad weak to grass, one is quad weak to ice, and only Hippowdon gets by without any glaring issues. We also have the bonus of being able to use Magnet Rise. Magnezone makes itself immune to ground type moves on turn one of the battle, and then Hidden Power Grass one shots Whiskash, Golem, and Rhyperior. It was really nice of her to send them all in one after the other. There's a bit of a back and forth with Gliscor, who's only normally affected by Hidden Power, but even with a full restore and the use of Fire Fang, Bertha still can't take out Magnezone. Hippowdon's the last line of defense, and by living through Hidden Power, she's able to pick up the win with Crunch. For some reason, I went out to Bastiodon next, which was an extraordinarily bad move. Earthquake hands Hippowdon a second knockout before we call an Agron to finally put an end to the battle. Was Bertha terrible? Yeah, but she deserves our respect for living that quad week lifestyle. It's a real power move. Unfortunately, Flint is up next, and after the nightmarish time we had against Barry's Infernape, I'm really not feeling confident going into this one. We're using Scizor, Parasect, Foratress, Paras, and Abomasnow, and there's really only one way through this battle. We get things going with Scizor facing off against Houndoom, and we need a critical hit on Aerial Ace, or we lose. Luckily, Scizor pulls that off right away, meaning we've now got Flint's Infernape to deal with, which is fun. The big thing in our favor here is that Infernape only has physical attacks. We recall Scizor and send out Paris, who's incinerated by a crit flare blitz, but importantly, Effect Spore kicks in to put Infernape to sleep. That right there is our win condition. We make another switch back to Scizor and as quietly as possible call for agility. When Infernape doesn't wake up, we go for Swords Dance, and with that, we're done. Aerial Ace wipes out Infernape, and honestly, this battle is a wrap. Scizor finishes off the battle with one-shots on Flareon, Rapidash, and Magmortar. The final Aerial Ace that connected with Magmortar left Scizor burnt, but that doesn't really matter now. Originally, I thought this one might be unwinnable, but we got through it on our second attempt. We had to score a critical hit against Houndoom and then needed Effect Spore to put Infernape to sleep. Even ignoring our need for Infernape to stay asleep a while, that alone is a 1 in 160 chance. So, yeah, that was really lucky. Let's just accept it and move on. Lucian is the fourth and final Elite Four member, and he specializes in the psychic typing, meaning we've only got two available Pokemon, Krogunk and Toxicroak. That means we'll be using a team of three Toxicroak and two Krogunk, which doesn't feel great. Mr. Mime starts the battle for Lucian, and we lead off with our best Toxicroak and call for Swagger. This is another battle which requires some setup. After Mr. Mime hits himself in confusion, Toxicroak uses Sword Stance to raise his attack power, but unlike Scizor, we don't need a speed boost. Toxicroak can learn Sucker Punch, which is the only thing that gave me hope here. For those unaware, Sucker Punch is a dark type attack that will always land first if your opponent has selected an attack. The first one wipes out Mr. Mime, but Bronzong's up next. Lucian spends the first two turns using Calm Mind, which doesn't really change our situation. On the third turn, after presumably attempting Psychic, Bronzong gets its bell rung by a Sucker Punch. Toxicroak scores a critical hit that I'm pretty sure was necessary to take Lucian down to three. Sadly, Gallade isn't weak to Dark-type moves, so he survives the Sucker Punch and counters with a Psycho Cut that was always going to one-shot poor Toxicroak. I made the bold decision of calling on Toxicroak next, and the strategy hasn't changed. Sucker Punch finishes off Gallade and deals a good chunk of damage to Espeon before Psychic puts an end to Toxicroak number two. This time we go out to Krogunk to mix things up and use Mud Slap knowing a full restore is coming. Sucker Punch takes Espeon back below half health before he misses an attempted Psychic. That is some elite Krogunk gameplay. Sucker Punch finishes off the Eeveelution, leaving Lucian with only his Alakazam. 
Krogunt tries her best but comes up just short with Psychic putting an end to her brief yet beautiful reign of terror. That is elite Alakazam spoon play. If Lucian was smart, he'd have figured out our strategy by now and would have called for a cover, but apparently he's not. One final sucker punch finishes the battle after only like 30 minutes of trying. Thankfully, for those of you who hate me, Cynthia is up next, and this one did not take 30 minutes. We're back onto shift now, but you may be looking at this team and thinking that things aren't really adding up. By day two, I had forgotten the rules to my own challenge. After literally hundreds of attempts, I'd settled on using Gengar as my counter for Spiritomb as neither Dark nor Ghost have any quad weak opponents in Gen 4. Heracross was my match for Togekiss, Tyranitar was there for Lucario, Rhyperior was on hand for both Milotic and Roserade while we had two different Aggrons for Garchomp, which is sort of breaking the rules. Originally I was using one Aggron for Garchomp and had a Swampert for Roserade, but on the rare occasion that I made it to Garchomp, it was basically impossible to get through. On the one occasion I did, Heracross missed Stone Edge against Togekiss, which was really painful. I don't particularly want to sift through the obscene amount of footage I have to find it, but I later learned a regular Stone Edge wouldn't have been enough anyway. The reason I switched to this team is that I realized that maybe one in every 50 attempts, Rhyperior was taking down Milotic and Roserade solo. So Swampert wasn't being used on those runs through, and we needed help against Garchomp. Let me just run you through how this battle looked. Gengar vs Spiritomb was an easy win with our only losses coming when Cynthia's Ghost Rock landed a critical hit. So about 94% of the time we were making it to Milotic. On this run we even got a critical hit of our own to speed things up. The nice probability plummets off a cliff here though. With just Rhyperior around to battle Milotic and Roserade, we needed Cynthia to call for Mirror Coat allowing us to attack first. On top of that, we couldn't miss Horn Drill or we were done. So Cynthia went for Mirror Coat maybe once every 5 goes against Rhyperior and Horn Drill's got a 30% chance of hitting. Alright, so we were making it to Roserade just over 1 in every 20 attempts. This is where it gets briefly easy. Unless Roserade landed a crit energy ball, we'd always make it past her, but Cynthia usually went for Toxic anyway, for some reason. In several hundred runs using this specific team, Roserade never knocked out Rhyperior, which seems crazy. Lucario is up next for Cynthia, and this is another easy one. After Tyranitar unfortunately sets up a Sandstorm, we just have to avoid a critical hit on Aura Sphere, and we're all good. Unlike Roserade, Lucario landed plenty of crits to kill our chances, but again, we were probably batting like 90% against him. Then came Garchomp. This was just horrible. Getting past this thing with one Aggron was possible. I did it once. We basically need our incredibly defensive Aggron to live an Earthquake and then connect with a Tract which is now only 80% accurate thanks to Sandfail. If I could have used anything but a Sandstream Tyranitar, I would have. Then we needed it to be immobilized by love for 3 straight turns while we land back to back to back 80% accurate Dragon Claws. It was just horrible. Keep in mind I would only get to Garchomp maybe once or twice an hour. I think the best hope would be to connect with two Dragon Claws while Garchomp is infatuated with the second one being a critical hit, which is about a 0.8% chance. The reason for that is a couple of times 3 wasn't even enough thanks to Garchomp's Citrus Berry. In this run, which I'm now realizing has 2 level 62, so there's another rule break, we still got insanely lucky. I lost my mind and started switching around at one point and Garchomp missed a Dragon Rush, but this is definitely not valid. In the end, back when I was so delirious that I believed I was following the rules, I realized that I couldn't rely on Heracross connecting with a critical hit. I knew I was cheesing it a bit, but I switched around a lot to let the Sandstorm weaken Togekiss knowing that an accurate Stone Edge would deal about 90% damage. When Heracross eventually came out, it ended up scoring a critical hit anyway, making all of the switching pointless. So yes, we beat Cynthia, but no, it wasn't at all within the rules. Was this possible? Yeah, absolutely. I was one crit Stone Edge away on one of my legal attempts. You got a 1 in 20 chance of connecting with Stone Edge and it being a critical hit, so I was that close. If my quick math is correct, the chances of me even making it to Togekiss with the original team was about 1 in 1381. The odds of making it that far and getting the needed critical hit would be 1 in 27,624. I hope you'll forgive me for not trying this again. So, yes, technically you can beat Pokemon Platinum using only quad weak Pokemon, but I did not do it. I got somewhat close though. If you made it this far, I truly hope you enjoyed. 
Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time.